Hi, welcome to First Chapter Friday. My name is Lucy, and the book that I will be reading, the first chapter of today, is called Hope in the Valley, and this is by Matali Perkins. Hope in the Valley is, in a way, an historical novel. It takes place in 1980 in Silicon Valley area in California, and it is about a middle schooler named Pandita Paul. She lives with her father and her two older sisters. Pandita's mother died when they were visiting Pandita's grandparents in the village in India where Pandita's mother grew up. They all went back there for a vacation and something happened to Pandita's mother and she didn't come home with them. Pandita misses her mother dearly and one way that she communicates with her is through letters that she continues to write her every year on her mother's birthday. She goes and sits in this place that was this special sort of hideout where she and her mother would sit and talk. In order to get there, they had to go through these bushes across the street and sneak onto the porch of this old kind of falling down house in this apricot orchard and sit on the swing and they would talk and talk. And this is where Pandita goes to think about her mother and to write to her mother. It's a very special place. This place is also under debate for whether or not it should be turned into housing and should it be turned into rental housing or housing to own. And around that conversation, there are a lot of conversations about preservation and memory and also immigration. This book deals a lot with the ideas around who should be able to live where. There's a lot in here about Asian, East Asian immigration and the history of it to this country. But what this book really focuses on is Pandita finding her voice in different ways. In a musical, speaking up in the city council, with her friends, with a new boy who lives in town, through poetry. And in all those different ways, we get to know Pandita and her family situation and the community situation that happened in this book. I will now read the first chapter of Hope in the Valley. One, our front porch is a mess. Stepping around a discarded skateboard and a rusty tricycle, I avoid a couple of splintery wooden chairs and make my way down the steps. As I cross the street to the old Johnson place, I move slowly, casually, in case eyes are tracking me. The riskiest part of this escape is ducking behind the overgrown oleander bushes but I'm careful as always. There, now I'm hidden, but I'm not inside yet. Ma's makeshift wire twist still keeps the flap of fencing attached to its post. I unfasten it and the section swings slightly into the abandoned Johnson property like a gate, leaving just enough room for me to slip through. I came here almost every day last summer and this summer I plan to do the same. That's one advantage to living with three busy people. I can come and go without a lot of questions. The first time I crawled through this opening, I was four years old. I'd followed Ma across the street and into the prickly rosemary bushes. When she spotted me, she smiled, led me inside, and asked me to keep her escape a secret. Now I'm the only person on earth who knows how to get into Ashar Jaiga, as Ma and I called it. Ma's name, Asha, which means hope. Ma's place, Ashar Jaiga, place of hope. I need a dose of hope after my last conversation with Mr. Marvin. Time steals your memories, Pandita, he told me. These days, I can't even recall the sound of my mother's voice. And then he'd sighed a long, sad exhale that felt like it drew the breath out of me too. Work hard to remember it, kid. I wish I had. That's why I come here, to remember. I make my way between the oaks, pass an old water tank, and push through the tangle of weeds in what used to be straight rows of apricot trees. A few are starting to bear fruit. Every July, Ma and I tasted the ripe apricots that fell without getting bruised. We never took any home. They were ours to borrow, not to claim, Ma told me. Roses, lilies, and lavenders grow in the garden. The house didn't last as long as the garden and the orchard, and what's left of it is rusted and broken. The front steps collapsed long before Ma started bringing me along, so I have to reach for the railing to pull myself up onto the sagging porch. Here it is, my destination, a two-person port swing, Ma's and mine. I sink into one of the faded flowery cushions, the glider still works, and there's a spray can of oil nearby that I use if it starts to creak. I like it quiet, no sounds except for leaves rustling and birds singing. For a while, I sit there swinging. A dove hidden somewhere in the orchard sings a mournful tune. 
The melody reminds me of Ma's singing. She was quiet and so am I, but here words poured out like the streams that water my grandparents' jute farm. Sitting side by side on this swing, she showed me how to weave garlands. Once our heads were crowned with flowers, she'd listen while I talked about school and shared my poems. Then I'd listen while she sang or told stories from the village where she'd grown up. Time seemed to stand still when I heard about close calls with crocodiles hidden along muddy banks, festival celebrations with cousins, rescuing chickens from a python that had crawled into the coop, and how she'd used rice powder paint to create Alpana designs on the front step. I pick up the cushion beside me and unbutton the cover. Hidden under the padding are my most precious possessions. First, four handwritten lavender-scented notes from Ma. They're short and I have them memorized, but I always open them anyway. I like to picture my mother's long, graceful fingers guiding a pen across the card, bangles clinking as she shapes the curves, dots, and lines of her penmanship. They're all addressed to dearest Pandu, and each one is signed, forever yours, Ma. When I long to be back in the village, being with you makes me feel at home again. Your gift of words will bring joy and hope to the world. Your quiet, listening spirit helps me share things I keep deep inside. Reading so many good stories has made you courageous and loving. Rummaging again inside the cushion, I pull out a ribbon-tied stack of notes in my handwriting and a box of her scented stationery. Only two blank cards and matching envelopes are left now, one here and one in my room, and they're so old I can hardly smell any lavender. Ma used to buy them in bulk, but from where? I have no idea, and I can't ask Baba. There's nothing worse than seeing his jawline tighten at the sound of her name. Uncapping the pen I've brought along, I take one of the note cards and start writing. June 13th, 1980. My darling Ma, it's my 13th birthday, so here I am. I met my goals from last year to write one poem a month and read at least 25 books. This year, I can't think of any goal to set. All I really want is to go back in time, and that's impossible. Anyway, Indy's cooking a special dinner, and there's a pile of presents waiting. My best present, though, is that today was the last day of seventh grade. Now I get three blissful months before eighth grade, the whole summer without having to see Katrina Reed glued to Gemma's side, watching them pretend I don't exist. Indy's probably wondering where I am, so I should get back. Ma, it's like I'm in a boat and you're on the shore, and time takes us further apart with every birthday. I miss you. I love you. Forever yours, Pandu. As I untie the ribbon and add this note to the others I've written, a twinge of worry over Mr. Marvin's words makes my stomach jump. Are my memories of Ma slipping away? The last birthday she celebrated with me was my 10th. All five of us were in India for some of that summer, but the days after June 23rd, 1977 are blurry in my mind. Mostly, I remember that we came back to California without her. Maybe that's why the last thing I've hidden inside this pillow is my favorite, a gift that my grandfather tucked into my hand before we left for the airport. The black and white photo shows a girl standing in the shade of a banana tree. The handwriting on the back of the photo says, Asha, age 13. The age I am now. She's tall and lanky with no curves yet, like me. Her hair is in two braids, like mine, and she looks serious. But when I look closer, I see the stories and jokes in her eyes. I want to remember them forever. But how? Time makes everything disappear. People, keepsakes, memories, the thief of time. Ooh, good title for a poem. I'll have to write it later. It swept the Johnsons away from this place. My darling Ma will never visit Ashar Jayaga again. Does it have to take my memories away too? I raise a fist against the sun, which is lower on the horizon now. I should at least put up a fight. If my enemy is going to turn me into a teenager today, whether I like it or not, I'm old enough to set a big goal. Let's call it Operation Remember Ma. This means my sister and I have to revoke the pact we made three years ago. It was Shar's idea, but Indy and I agreed to it right away. Baba looked so devastated every time Ma's name came up. We promised never to cry in front of him or talk about her at home. Now our silence has become habit, a bad one if you're trying to remember someone. I'll call my mission Orm for short. Because as my English teacher says, what writer doesn't love a good acronym? O-R-M. Orm. 
Just repeating the letters in my head fills me with hope. Dropping a kiss on Ma's photo, I tuck it back into the cushion and head home. And that is the end of chapter one. Mr. Marvin, who Pandita refers to in this chapter, is a man who lives in a retirement home in Pandita's town. And she is friends with him. She brings him library books and she goes and talks to him. She reads her poetry to him. He's one of the few people who hears her poetry. She considers him to be one of her closest friends. One of Pandita's goals was revealed to us in this chapter when we hear about her wanting to talk more about her mother and how difficult it is to continue to try and remember somebody if you're never speaking about them. That memory piece is really big in this book as our friendship and grief and the housing crisis that is on the horizon at the time that this book takes place. It's really also a coming of age story and how Pandita learns to balance memories and the old things with the new things and new experiences. I really enjoyed reading Hope in the Valley by Matali Perkins and I encourage you to give it a try. Thank you for joining me.